So, this is the Monero presentation, the definitive Monero presentation. If you watch any Monero presentation, this is going to be the one. Um, this is not actually. This talk is actually not just going to tell you about Monero and how it works. I'm going to kind of cover some of the basics of blockchain in general. So, if you're kind of iffy on the details of blockchain, or you're um, wondering how it's going to work, then this is the talk for you. If you do know about all this stuff already, then this should mostly be review. But it's okay to hear it from another person, a different point of view. Um, that's still okay. You don't have to be all uppity about your knowledge and kind of like, I already know all this. <laughs> um, so, Monero. Um, as I have come to understand Monero in my past two and a half years in the project, uh, I have seen that there are three big defining pillars that make it stand out from the crowd of shit coins that exist. Um, as you, most of you know, there is many, many thousands of cryptocurrencies. There are so many cryptocurrencies with all sorts of fun little names, some of them trying to be cute, some of them trying to be techy, some of them trying to be next gen. But so what kind of separates Monero from these? I mean, because the reality is that Monero doesn't really have a very big claim to fame. It's kind of boring. It's like, we're like Bitcoin, but we're private. Yay. You know, IOTA's like, we're going to like open the data silos. And Ethereum's like, we're the world computer. And, you know, none of these things have yet proven that they can do the things that they're claiming to do, which, you know, so Monero could also say, we're going to like open your garage doors. We can claim anything that we want. Um, just like a lot of these are claiming that they're going to do a lot of crazy things. But Monero actually delivers on its promise, but it's a pretty boring promise. So uh, we have that going for us, which is nice. But uh, I'm going to kind of cover these three pillars uh, that I think Monero, um, particular, these three things really help Monero stand apart from the crowd. And in so doing, as I cover these pillars, we're going to kind of talk about blockchain in general, learn about all these different things. So it's going to be kind of cool. So these three pillars, as you can clearly see, uh, I, don't, I try not to be that guy that just reads his slides verbatim. You know, you have a bullet point. You have five bullet points, and you read them off, and you go to the next slide, and you read the next slide. So please forgive me for being uh, too on the nose here. But these three pillars are historical ethos, economics, and technology. And we're going to cover each of those uh, in turn. So we're going to start with the ethos. Wait, what are my three pillars? Ethos? Okay. So <laughs> we're going to start with ethos. What makes Monero, like what is the heart of Monero? What makes Monero what it is? Um, so most of you who are here probably know and are aware of this term, but... Oh no, this thing wrapped. Okay, so we have we have this term that we call cipher pun with a k at the end over here. But if you put those two things together, it turns into cypherpunk. And this uh, spelled with a ph. So the idea behind cypherpunk is that we try to make social change utilizing cryptography and mathematics because we realize that humans are corruptible. Okay, we realize that humans can could not just become corrupt, but can corrupt the things that they touch. And this is true in the realm of politics. This is true in the realm of technology. This is true in the realm of society. Humans can be corrupted and, as a result, corrupt the things that they are involved with. Is this the case with all humans? You know, I'm not going to try to get into ethics or philosophy or religion or anything, depending on where your position on any of these, these things are. But every human has the potential for these things. And we have seen good people go bad and bad people people go good and all these kinds of things. The point is that there is a variable, there is a level of uncertainty about which humans are bad, which humans are good, and which will become corrupted with, a, with enough power and how much money. So instead of you know just kind of being in a constant state of wonder and worry about whether or not uh, corrupt humans are going to corrupt our systems, we decide what if we take away this attack surface? What if we remove this attack surface entirely to the best of our ability? What if we stop corrupt humans from being able to corrupt systems? How in the world would we do this? So, you know, as an example of how we do this non-mathematically, we have our law system. We have some, a, a way where we can, uh, you know, sue each other or, or things like this, where we can uh, in, do investigations into each other so we can try to bring the truth into the light. So if I feel that somebody has wronged me, I can take them to court. We have a third-party arbiter there. This person is an objective third party hopefully, right? And they're able to listen to my arguments, the other person's arguments. They're able to collect evidence and they're, be, they're able to give a verdict. So we don't have to resort to violence because we can, we can do our best to bring truth to light. But even in this system, there is corruptibility. What if you were to get a corrupt judge? What if you were to get corrupt lawyers, right? So um, even in our best social efforts to try to reduce kind of he said, she said situations to uh, utilize objective thir th third parties, these objective third parties may not be all that objective to begin with. Um, 
So, oh, so that's good moving. I thought it was a different slide coming up next. So we're going to stick here for just a second. So what we do instead is we try to reduce this attack surface with mathematics. This is something where nobody can really say, well, math is subjective at, um, I mean, uh, so I'm not going to get into that. But yeah, for the most part, math is not subjective, right? You have 1 plus 1 equals 2. This is the case regardless of your political ideology, regardless of your religious preferences, regardless of any uh, particular viewpoints or worldviews you have, 1 plus 1 equals 2 on a base 10 system. So uh, <laughs> um, we, we say because there is this objectivity in mathematics, what if we can enforce certain things in society? This gets really, really difficult because how, how do we, first of all, how do we translate this abstract numbers math stuff to human society and relationships and how we work together? And then also, how do we enforce it? Um, so this is where things like Bitcoin come around, and we're going to start talking about how it um, de develops from cypherpunk ideology. Um, but cypherpunk ideology touches everything that we do as hackers and FOSS people, even though we don't realize it. So... Um, Things like FLOSS, things like uh, this stands for Free Libre Open Source Software, which I'm sure most of you here know. These are things, uh, FLOSS and uh, encryption. I think encryption is actually the next slide. No, this is the human attack factor. This should have been, this was what I was expecting to come a little bit earlier. Look, at, oh, I love, I love how none of this works. Um, this is, this is fantastic. There's the example S. Um, I do apologize uh, for, you know, I don't have to apologize to you guys for anything. I owe you all nothing, and you're you're lucky to be in my presence. So, <laughs> so um, we one of the things that we try to do we, we do utilize social movements to try to get cypherpunk things going, but we do try also try to utilize hard mathematics, and we're really going to delve into that with Bitcoin. Um, but this open source software movement, this free software movement, is coming from this idea that we want people to be free. We want people th to have the opportunity. Um, to not have the system take advantage of them and to not have this corruptibility. So if you can also see that in the heart of open source software where we say, okay, a business says, well, you're not going to pay this much for my, for my uh, software or so, so similar to what somebody like Adobe did where before you were able to purchase their software for money and now you own it and can use it. And then they kind of switch to a, a different funding model where you have to pay monthly to utilize Photoshop and stuff like that. And some people were fine with that. Some people were not fine with that. The, the point is... And some might argue that they, they either became more corrupt or less corrupt in doing this. It depends on your viewpoint. The sands began to shift underneath you. You didn't know what to expect. You did not know what was coming. So open source software tries to give this level playing field, this level playing field for everybody. Because maybe under the old Adobe system, some people were able to um, afford it and others were not. And under this new system, other people were able to afford it and others, were, are, and others are not able to. Okay, so as things shift, different people are going to be able to do different things. And we, we want to level that playing field. And in particular, this helps marginalize people groups. And I will give an example where um, I was approached by a scammer on Telegram. right? And uh, I, I've, I have a lot of fun with scammers, just as I have a lot of fun on the stage. I, I mess with these scammers. You know, I lead them on. I, do, I, I have a lot of fun with them. And I actually scammed him into revealing who he was where he was located, <laughs> gave me his picture, and, and I know it's him because I, I had him do a very specific, like, give me your pinky to your cheek type thing so I know it's actually you, and he, he did it. And so I got all this information out of him, and I offered him a job. Okay, I have a, I have a small design firm. I'm the owner of a small business. Uh, and I told him, okay, I will teach you to design. I will teach you to, um, <clears throat> to you know, have a real career, and I'll pay you for work. Do I expect it to be good work? Not at the beginning, um, but you know, over time, I, maybe you can, become, you can make something for yourself. This ended up not working out for a variety of reasons, but the cool thing about this was I didn't need to either buy him Photoshop or um, make an investment into this or pay for this monthly or, or have him pirate it. I just had him download GIMP. Is it the absolute best that we have right now in terms of design? No, it's not, but it's free and it's available for somebody like him in Africa in poverty. So this levels the playing field. This levels the playing field for everybody. Now no longer is human corruption an attack vector on somebody's lifestyle, on, the, on their ability to rise themselves from poverty. Now they have an option to learn something and make a better life for themselves. This is the heart of free open source software. It empowers people to live better lives and make better skills and be better versions of themselves. This is why I love this movement. It's got such a compassionate heart at its core. And this 
compassionate heart is very much present in Monero, and we get when we start to talk about Monero, uh, we'll understand why. So now that I've set that stage for the historical ethos of open source software as a whole, we're going to go ahead and move into the economics. So this is where, if you don't really understand Bitcoin, you don't understand blockchain as a whole, you know, what, what is this whole, um, what is, what, people keep talking about economic incentives and all these types of things. This is where all of that comes into play. Um, we're going to start here. Value. One of the biggest questions asked about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as a whole is, there's nothing behind them. What gives them any sort of value? This is a fantastic question, but first we have to take a step back and ask, what gives something value at, ever? What gives anything value? Does anybody have any ideas? Uh, cost? Trust. Okay. Trust. Any other ideas? Uh, demand, supply and demand. Okay. Uh, so I can't be up here forever, so I am not, I'm not going to be able to uh, wait for any more answers. Well, basically, uh, what gives something value is agreement. Agreement. So agreement is this idea that everybody agrees that something has value. It's as simple as that. And, and if that sounds too simplistic, let me give you an example. Let's say uh, you play an online video game, like what's one of the ones from the 90s? There was like Neo, Neopets, right? So you, you play Neopets, and I, I haven't played Neopets, but I, I'm going to pretend that they have Neopets currency, Neopets coin, coins or uh, any sort of currency. And I have eggs, real world something, right? Because I do have chickens, so I have eggs, and they lay eggs, and I have two chickens, they lay green eggs. That's kind of cool. So you like my chickens' green eggs, because you want green eggs and ham for whatever reason. And um, so I, you say, hey, Diego, I will give you uh, 10,000 Neopets points in exchange for your eggs. Now, let's say I do play Neopets. I'm an avid fan. I can't get enough. I spend 12 hours a day. I have a real problem, and you're just, um, you're just uh, enabling me. I will say, yes, OK, that, that, that makes sense to me. I value these Neopets points. There is agreements between you and I that these things have value. And because of that, I will give you my eggs in exchange. But if I do not play this game, and I have no desire to play this game, you know, I'm not a gamer to begin with, and you know, I have other things to do with my life, these, pets, these points have no value to me. So there is no agreement between you and I on value. So it's not going to be exchanged. So that's all good and fine for kind of internet currencies or whatever, but the same is actually true of our fiat currencies in our, in our wallets. Euros, dollars, pesos, whatever you use. And it, it does definitely get much more complicated when it's not between two individuals, but in, instead between an entire nation and their governments. And not now in our global world, it's between countries, which gets even more difficult. But we do see this on the, on the macro level, but also on the teeny tiny level where you have a person like, okay, I come from the United States, I have dollars, I need euros. So even though there's kind of an exchange rate that banks and countries agree on that fluctuates day to day, if I go to you and I say, hey, I want dollars because I'm going to be heading back home soon, I don't need euros, you're free to set your own price. And I'm free to say whether I think that's a good deal or not. So there is this, this whole thing about agreement that drives value. When people agree on something in mass, this is kind of how we get fiat currencies, um, although there's a little bit more to it because governments are able to enforce usage of fiat currencies. When I say fiat, if for those who don't know the term, it just means currencies that the government prints, distributes, and uh, recommends, sometimes enforces, the usage of. Um, <clears throat> The other big thing is scarcity. Uh, I, once again, I do apologize for the, the weird things going on with the slides, but I think you guys are smart enough to figure this out. The other thing that does drive value, but it ultimately does feed into agreement, is scarcity. The more scarce something is, the more value we attribute, it to, uh, we attribute to it. If I have sand, you know, we're at the beach, and I reach down, and I grab some sand, and I say, hey, I will give you this sand in exchange for your eggs. You will reach down and grab your own handful of sand. You say, I am just as rich as you are in sand. I don't need your sand. Right? But then you've got something very valuable like gold. There's only a limited amount of it on this planet. And because it's much more scarce, we can say, OK, uh, I, uh, Diego, I'll give you this gold for your, for your eggs. OK, I agree that this has value because I know that it is scarce. There's only a limited amount of it that exists in this world. Using this, some people also make artificial scarcity, where you can you know, maybe make a limited run of a certain kind of guitar. There was only 100 of these kind of guitars ever made. Guess what? They could probably make more of that kind of guitar in the factory. And you could probably buy another guitar that will play just as well. But because of this artificial scarcity that they've created, they have artificially inflated the value of this kind of guitar. So now that we kind of understand um, what gives something value, and, and we've kind of discussed scarcity, we need to talk about inflation. Uh, for those of you who don't know, inflation is actually a really simple concept. It's something we hear a lot about. But it's this idea that something 
was scarce and is becoming less scarce over time. So when somebody, you know, let's say only $100,000 have ever existed in the entire world. But then the government, in order to pay for its debts or to pay for different programs, they print another $100,000. They have doubled the supply. Now all of a sudden, there is twice as much dollars in existence in the world. So every individual dollar is worth less. How much less? Well, that, that's, it's not as simple as, well, it's now worth half as much because, once again, there are certain agreements that go on between people, between society at large. This is kind of how inflation works. So now we're kind of getting towards Bitcoin. What, I'm talking about all this economic stuff. What does all this have to do with anything? So Bitcoin was made sort of as, if you read uh, the message that was imprinted into the first block, of which I don't remember the exact verbiage, but kind of paraphrased, it's this idea that the American banks were getting a bailout from the government. This was happening in 2009. Uh, they were being very irresponsible with people's money. They were giving out loans willy-nilly to people that uh, wouldn't normally uh, be able to get these loans. And as a result, a lot of these people weren't paying those loans back. The banks were about to go under. A lot of people were about to lose money. So the government printed a lot of money to get these banks out of debt. And in so doing, they devalued the currency of every single person that owned dollars. So it was like an invisible tax that happened on the American people and anyone else worldwide who held dollars because of the irresponsibility of a wealthy few. So one of the ideas behind Bitcoin, one of the things that helped spur the idea was, once again, now we're going to kind of bring it back to the cypherpunk ethos. We said, because of the corruptibility of a few humans, many humans had to suffer. How do we reduce the attack surface so that corrupt humans cannot do this to each other again? And the answer was something like Bitcoin. For those of you who don't know, Bitcoin has a fixed supply. And we're going to kind of cover that in just a little bit. How much time do I have? I think we're doing pretty good. Okay. So um, with this idea where we can enforce on a protocol level how many Bitcoins will ever exist. Because with the government, they can print fiat money whenever they want. Hey, I want another million dollars. Okay, they'll tell the Fed, the Fed, Fed will print another million dollars, right? It's not quite as simple as that, but it, I mean, it's not quite as hard as we would hope for these people to be able to print the money. So it's variable how much more money will exist any given year. Whereas with Bitcoin, it says in the code and enforced by the protocol, there will only ever be, I don't remember because I don't follow Bitcoin too much, what, 21, 22 million Bitcoin that will ever, only ever exist, right? And if there is more, if, you know, if somebody tries to make more, the other nodes, the other computers that run the software will reject this. They say, no, we only know that there is 21, 22 million Bitcoin that are in existence. So this extra stuff that you have, it's not valid. In this way, we enforce on a protocol level how much there can be that will exist. So if somebody, very wealthy, very powerful, is irresponsible with the way that they handle out their money, there's nobody to come and bail them out. They have to suffer the responsibility of their corrupt actions. In this way, we reduce the human attack vector. We reduce this attack surface for corrupt humans to sink their claws into. Is this making sense? Okay, so blockchains, blockchains. We're gonna kind of discuss blockchains in general. Um, some people like blockchains, not Bitcoin. Um, that This word has become fairly known over the past few years. Um, I'm gonna take a quick, quick aside from this economic stuff that I've been talking about <coughs> to explain what blockchains are and how they work. I'm not going to go great into detail. I'm just going to give a, a brief, uh, high-level overview of how something like this might work. Traditional, and I'm going to do so by talking about databases and trust. The biggest, if there's one thing you get out of this talk, okay, blockchains, the only thing that they do is reduce trust. Reducing trust. It is just a database. It is just an extremely slow and inefficient database, and it's made to reduce trust. How does it do this? So as an example, okay, regular databases have a system maintainer. They have a database maintainer, somebody who has full admin access to this database. They can go in and they can mess with it and do whatever they want. We, we hope that they don't do anything malicious. We, in fact, we pay people based off how, much, how trusted they are in the space. Um, if you're a senior, um, a senior developer or database maintainer, then you're going to get a lot more because you have a track record of not messing with these things. Otherwise, they can do some pretty messed up stuff. Let's say you work for Amazon. There's a $1,000 TV that you really, really want. You go into the database. You make it $10. You purchase it. And then you go back into the database and make it $1,000 again. So you basically got a $1,000 TV for $10. This is what, uh, if you have you know, the uh, system 
if you have the system uh, maintainer credentials, this is what you can, an example of something that you can do. But we're trusting that they won't. But not only are you trusting in the person, you're trusting in their competence because they, they put up all these different protections, right? Firewalls, you know, a hierarchy of, uh, and hopefully they're using the, the uh, least access control model. But if a hacker does gain access, then he could do something malicious with the database. He can go ahead and go inside, to the, inside the database and tweak things to, to help himself or to steal things. Now, for TVs and Amazon or you know, any sort of regular little database out there, maybe it's not too big of a deal if it gets hacked. But the scary thing is that our money and financial institutions also work on databases. So when I go to the bank and I deposit $10, they don't take that $10 and put it in the Diego box. And when I come back for that $10 later, take out the same Diego box and give me the same $10. Right? They kind of put it in this big pool of money, this, this digital nebulous pool of money. And when I come to get $10, they give me somebody else's $10. Somebody else gave them that $10. I don't get the same one back. So if somebody is able to hack into our institutions, into the financial institutions and tweak money, maybe Diego had $10, now he has $1,000. So I can come and take that away. Or if somebody's trying to hurt me, I had 1,000, now I only have 10. What happened to all of my money? Right? So we're both trusting in the competence of the uh, people that are securing these databases, as well as the fact that they're not going to do anything themselves. But Okay, so we don't. We got to. We got to stay here on the on the database and trust. I thought I had a different slide. Oh shoot, I'm actually out of time. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and speed this up. Uh, what blockchains do is we say instead of trusting one person, what if we give a copy of the database to everybody? What if everybody has the database? Anybody who wants it. In this case, if I change something about me, Diego has one bitcoin. Ha ha. No, hacky hacky hacky. Diego has ten bitcoins, and I try to spend those bitcoins. You guys, on your versions of the database, you're like, yeah, but Diego, see, for us, it says that you only have one Bitcoin, not 10. And I checked with my friend, and I checked with my other friend, and they checked with their friends, and they say that you all only have one Bitcoin. So according to us, you don't have those nine other Bitcoins. We're not going to let you spend them. Okay? Or if somebody wants to hurt me so they hack into my computer, and they say, Diego has 10, haha, no, now he has zero. And I come back home, and I'm like, oh, shoot, what happened to all my Bitcoin? Did it get stolen? I ask my peers. And you're like, uh, well, according to us, Diego, you still have 10. And I asked my friend, and they asked their friends, and we asked all of our friends, and you still have those 10. It's just your database is out of whack. OK, I can delete my database and re-download it from you guys, and I have a correct version again. And I don't even have to trust anybody. If I download from one person, I'm trusting their, what they're giving me, but I can download from two people and compare. I can download from three people and compare. I can download from the whole network and compare. And in this way, I'm not trusting any single person or any single institution or individual. I'm trusting absolutely everybody, which is the same as trusting nobody in this particular case. I'm not going to get into anything like mining or anything like that. So the last thing I'm going to try um, bringing this around to is there is obviously a privacy trade-off here. If everybody knows what everybody is doing because everybody has record of what everybody is doing, then all of a sudden if one person, person A, gives money to person B, we can see that flow of funds because I have a copy of that. So there is a trade-off here in terms of privacy. There is a trade-off where now all of a sudden, not only can I see what everybody is doing, everybody can see what everybody is doing. And this is the big thing that Monero became concerned with. When we started looking into something like Bitcoin, we're like, hey, this is really cool, how we're limiting trust. We like the cypherpunk ethos. We like the economics that we're, you know, uh, with, with this kind of this hard cap going on, even though Monero doesn't have a hard cap, but that's another economic thing that we could talk about offstage. But we don't like this privacy trade-off that we have. So Monero came in, and Monero said, we love all these great things about Bitcoin, but this privacy thing is not, uh, is not acceptable to us. So we layered multiple privacy technologies on top of each other, ring signatures, ring CT, and stealth addresses, in order to hide and obfuscate these things. I don't have time to go into any of them, and I didn't think I would. So if you want more information about the, the technical aspects of how Monero works, then by all means, come see me off stage, and we have other volunteers that are going to be able to answer these questions for you as well. But this is the core of what makes Monero uh, very different and very crazy inside of this cryptocurrency space, because a lot of the other cryptocurrencies either don't have the cypherpunk mentality, they're doing this out of the Silicon Valley Wall Street idea to make money. Um, some of them do, not many of them, but with this idea to reduce the attack surface. Some of them uh, don't follow uh, strong economic theory. They just kind of make their own economics up as they go along. And 
others of them are kind of okay, and this includes Bitcoin, are kind of okay with this privacy trade-off, which I don't believe is a sane way to do financial systems in this current world. Um, none of you would just open your bank accounts and post them online for everybody to see or your credit card information, but this is basically what you're doing when you're transacting with a transparent currency. So I am definitely over time, uh, so this is where I'm going to sign off. We've got other great people who are going to be coming up and speaking. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. It says click to end presentation. So I'm going to now transition from presentation presenter mode to speaker mode we're gonna uh, or to MC mode we're gonna take about uh, five minutes to get the next uh, presenter up here which is Cheng Wong are you in the audience yes no are you here you know I could have kept going <laughs> um, so yeah, we're going to take about five minutes to get him on stage, uh, to locate him and get him on stage. Yes, yeah, thank you. You can applaud if you'd like. Uh, we'll be right back. <laughs> Turn me back. I, I, am, I am a moron. Um, my talk was not a 15-minute talk. It was a 30-minute talk. <laughs> I'm scheduled for 30 minutes. It's been a, it's, it's been a long three days. <laughs> Uh, usually our talks are 15 minutes. Can you hear me? Am I on? Usually our talks are 15 minutes. So I was like, oh, shoot, I'm way over time. But I'm scheduled to go until 45. Um, so it, it's fine that Cheng Wong's not here. Um, before I do take questions, uh, there was another couple things I wanted to uh, discuss regarding Monero that I was hoping to get to that I did not get to. Um, is that OK? Yeah, are you guys cool with more Diego? <laughs> I am so sorry. Um, but hey, we roll with the punches here at the CDC cluster. This is what we're all about. Oh, look, there he is. OK, so you're, you're here for the next thing. Great. Um, OK, where was I? Monero's a thing. We like what Bitcoin did. They don't have a lot of privacy stuff, so we're not OK with that. Um, cool. That's, we're going to start there. Brand new conversation, brand new presentation, <coughs> Monero for scrubs. So the way that Monero does this, is that uh, we have what I like? We we have three different things here. We have ring signatures, we have ring CT, and we have stealth addresses. And those hide the sender, the amount, and the receiver, respectively. So how ring signatures work? Just once again, not getting into the super nitty gritty, but just kind of how they work in general, is that when I send an output, and you're going to hear this a lot, a lot, and what output basically means is a bill, right? A note, so like a five uh, five euro bill, a ten euro bill, a one dollar bill, whatever the case may be. Those those individual bills, that's what outputs are. When I send an output, I have in Monero's case, 10 decoy outputs that are also put on the table for the receiver to take. Now, only one of those is actually real, but to any outside observer, all of them look real. And the only people who understand which one is real is the receiver and the sender. And so uh, this, this, is a, this, this anonymity set of outputs, there's a misconception that if you break this ring signature, you reveal the sender, and this is not true. If you break the ring signature, you reveal the output, which is definitely metadata that we don't want to leak because metadata kills. Metadata is incredibly powerful, and the more you have about it, the more you can reduce this anonymity set. But breaking this ring signature does not reveal the sender. It does not reveal the person. It reveals the output. It reveals the bill. And so in doing this, we, we, we obfuscate the sender. Ring CT obfuscates the amount. So that way, if you look on the blockchain, you cannot see uh, what the amount was that was transacted. Now, this becomes an issue because, remember, we want to try to enforce how many Monero or how many Bitcoin are in existence at once. And if we don't know how many uh, uh, of these things are being transacted, how do we enforce this? Because what happens if I find a bug in the protocol and I send 10 Monero to you, but you receive magically 50 Monero? Then we have inflated, we have inflated Monero by 40. 40 Moneros. Uh, does that make sense? So if I am able to send a certain X amount of Monero and you're able to receive more, or vice versa, if I send and you didn't receive that exact amount, you received less than that, then Monero has been created or destroyed, and this kind of destroys the entire economic model where we're, tr we're trying to stop people from, corrupt people from abusing the system. Because if this was possible, a corrupt person might abuse this system. They might try to make less Monero or more Monero, depending on what they're trying to do. So Monero uses clever mathematics, right? Monero uses clever mathematics to make this possible. And I'm going to give you a very simple example that is not exactly how this works, but it's pretty similar, and I wish I had it on the slide. So we want one side of the equal sign to be the same as the other side of the equal sign. 10 
sent, 10 received. 10 equals 10, right? Does that make sense? Now, if I can exchange a secret number with you, let's say that number is five, only you and I, sender and receiver, know this secret number of five. We multiply both sides of the equation by five, and now 50 equals 50. This is the number that can be given to the outside world. This is the number that shows, see, both sides still equal. What is sent and what was received are still the same thing. Monero was not created or destroyed in this transaction without revealing what the actual number was, the actual number being 10, because we had that secret number that you and I both multiplied by. And because we both know that secret number, in our wallet software, we just divide by that secret number and get the real number of Monero that was transacted. Does that, does that make sense? So that's kind of, that's not how Ring CT works. It's much more complicated, but it's, it's an example of using clever mathematics to try to get around this problem. It's an example of this whole cypherpunk movement of using math to do something that we thought might not be possible. Okay, so um, stealth addresses are pretty easy. They're basically just a, uh, a hash of the person's base public address. Uh, if you know anything about privacy in Bitcoin, it's very, very difficult to actually get right. They say don't do address reuse. You shouldn't reuse addresses. You shouldn't, uh, if you use a mixer, you shouldn't consolidate things. This is where Bitcoin maximalists get a little bit crazy. They say, okay, so here's this laundry list of things that you have to do, these 15 steps. You can't mess any of them up or you're screwed. You have to do this long list of 15 things to be private in Bitcoin, um, and the privacy is very, very fragile. And there's a lot of metadata that, metadata that is leaked. Um, because it's not enforced on the protocol level, because it's not mandatory and everybody ha doesn't have to use it, um, the reality is that the privacy level is, is quite fragile. And I said this uh, at the very beginning, of C3 when I was on stage and I was kind of giving an intro to Monero talk, but it's not you that you have to worry about. If you take all of these steps and you do everything perfectly, but you transact with a person that doesn't do, do all this perfectly, then that person's lack of privacy is going to affect you because now that person is going to be linked to you. And similar to what, how we see uh, social network graphs in Facebook where even if you don't have a Facebook account, Facebook knows that you exist because they have everybody around you and all of those things point into a direction, and that direction is a person. Maybe you're in pictures. Maybe your name is mentioned. They know, they know that you exist. They know your name. In many cases, they know a lot of your preferences, even though you yourself don't have a Facebook account. A similar thing can happen with Bitcoin. Bitcoin only works as if absolutely everybody is absolutely private 100% of the time without fail and without uh, messing anything up, making any mistakes. Otherwise, this network graph is going to point to something, and that something is going to be you. Monero says, we don't want to take any of these chances. You know, we, what if we make everybody private by default? Some, some uh, cryptocurrencies say, what about opt-in privacy? We're just going to do privacy, you know, so um, if you want privacy, you can have it. And if you don't need it, then you don't need it, and you don't have to use it. This also doesn't work, um, both because the pe only people who are going to pay extra, whether it's time, money, resources, or whatever, to opt into this privacy are generally going to be people who, um, <clears throat> if you saw Daniel Kim's talk about kind of the race to the bottom, the peaches and the lemons, you can kind of look more into that. But uh, this opt-in privacy doesn't work. The anonymity set is always very, very small. The, the privacy it gives is always very, very fragile. Um, and it's, it's better if everything is done by default and absolutely mandatory. It's, it's like forcing everybody to drive safely, uh, which I wish we could do in real life, but we can't. Um, it also affects this thing called fungibility. And this is the last topic I'm going to talk on. Fungibility is this idea that one of something is equal to another one of something. And they're pretty indistinguishable. So if that sounds kind of confusing, an example is that if you have a euro and I have a euro and we exchange euros, we now have different euros, but we have not exchanged any value, right? We both still have one euro's worth of euros. Well, the same is cannot be said for Bitcoin. If you have one Bitcoin and I have one Bitcoin and we exchange Bitcoins, even though we both still have one Bitcoin, there may have been a value transfer that took place. And the reason is, if I gave you a dirty, tainted Bitcoin or a Bitcoin that has been used very recently in an illicit transaction, like a drug transaction, child pornography, any sort of thing that is not condoned either by humanity or the powers that be, then all of a sudden you have a Bitcoin that could be subject to civil asset forfeiture, to um, somebody coming and knocking on your door and saying, hey, where did you get this Bitcoin? We don't like that you have this Bitcoin. Even if you had nothing to do with that, if 
you guys over here do some sort of drug transaction, and I'm over here selling T-shirts, and then one of you guys buys one of my T-shirts. Now, I'm in possession of that Bitcoin, even though I had nothing to do with his drug transaction. So I am a suspect in a drug case that I had nothing to do with. This affects the fungibility of something, because I may be, um, if I put this Bitcoin on an exchange, because I want to change it to, to real money, right, so I can live and buy apples for my kids, that exchange is going to shut down my account pending investigation. This kind of thing happens all the time. And nobody talks about it until it happens to you. Then you go to the internet and say, what do I do? And everyone says, you're screwed. What do you what do? You, do? you got to wait for the exchange to clear your account or you have to prove that you had nothing to do with that. Whereas with Monero, you don't have to worry about any of this. Similar to you don't know where this $5 bill in your pocket has been. You don't know where it's been. You don't care where it's been. right? You just use it. This is how Monero works. Because we don't know the history of any of these things. We cannot be held accountable for them. So actually, I, as a squeaky clean guy that doesn't do anything illicit or doesn't do anything wrong ever, because I'm just this b wonderful bundle of sunshine, I need Monero. A lot of people say only criminals need this level of privacy. No, I need Monero, not because I'm going to do something wrong, but because I want to protect myself from other people that are doing something wrong that could mess with my squeaky clean reputation if I accidentally get mixed up with their money. And this is not something that I have to worry about if I transact with Monero. Um, Running short on time, I have one minute, so I can maybe take one question. No questions. One question. Okay, but we don't have somebody come here. Come up here. Come here. Let's give my hand. Come here. Come up here. And I'm going to give you the microphone. Let's give my hand. Come on. Come on. Yay. <coughs> What's the question? Um, why is uh, pseudonymity not enough? Pseudonymity. Why is pseudonymity not enough? Why is pseudonymity not enough? Okay, so once again, I'm going to um, point you to network graphs. Uh, I'm going to point you to the fact that not everybody has a Facebook account, and those people are not just pseudonymous to Facebook. They are anonymous to Facebook, except that they're not. Because with the construction of network graphs, you can, you can uh, see who somebody is. Now, let me give you an example of where pseudonymity fails. Okay? Once again, this only works if you're 100% crystal perfect every single bit of the time. If you have a Bitcoin address and you use it, and you use it elsewhere, which addresses uh, reuse is not, um, is not encouraged in Bitcoin. It's very much discouraged in Bitcoin. Um, if you reuse an address for two different purposes, that can link those two things. Okay? But even if you don't reuse addresses, the fact that at some point, at some point, either you're going to do something with a KYC AML exchange, or somebody that you transact with is going to do something with a KYC AML exchange, or if we use Bitcoin like it's meant to be used and purchase something from a business, now all of a sudden we can see this business knows who you are, especially if I'm selling t-shirts and I have to ship the shirt to you. I know who you are. Outside observers might not know who you are, but I know who you are. Then if the government comes to me and says, hey, Diego, you got to give up this stuff, um, because we got this warrant that says blah, 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 blah. Okay, so they got a warrant. Well, here you go. Here's the city. Okay, so they have this list of people that have purchased T-shirts from me on May 22nd. They look through the blockchain, and there's your pseudonymous address. You're right. It's just an alphanumeric string, but now they have metadata to correlate it to. This is the big killer here. Metadata is the big killer here. Yes, pseudonymity is better than nothing, but when coupled with metadata, heck, metadata breaks Tor. Metadata breaks the greatest of our privacy tools. All of our privacy tools can be broken with metadata. And see, the nerds will say, the nerds will say, look, the tech did not break, okay? You're right, the person is still in jail, and, and he's going to have a great time saying, well, at least the tech didn't break. No, he's in jail because of the metadata. The metadata is what kills us. And the pseudonymity is not enough. The fragile privacy of pseudonymity is very overblown by people who say, okay, no, 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 this is going to be more than fine. There have already been people who have been visited by, by police who maybe have been put into jail because of blockchain analysis, which grows more and more powerful by the day. Um, I am over time, and we want to get Cheng Wang on stage because he's going to be talking with us about proof of work, less work, less work of proof of work. Uh, more efficient proof of work. So let's go ahead and get him up here. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, sorry for my mix up. I do apologize for that. You should have seen him running in. He's like, oh, shoot, I'm late. What was going on here? But no, it was my bad.